Welcome back, Bhushan, to the Happier at Work podcast. Uh, really excited to have you here today. I suppose just to provide a bit of context for listeners, uh, you appeared on the episode number 50 and then episode 100. And now I have you back again for episode 150, which I wasn't sure whether it was a joke when we're having a bit of back and forth on LinkedIn of, you know, would you come for episode 150? So I'm really delighted to have you back as my guest today. Do you want to give people a little bit of a flavor and what's changed since we last caught up? Yeah, absolutely. Great to uh, to be with you, Aoife, um, again. I mean, what's changed? I think the last one we spoke was maybe a couple, couple of years ago. I mean, what's changed is businesses are, are are back to kind of focusing on what they can control their people are slowly back in the office we're at 50 percent occupancy here in in new york um it's obviously not um there's there's also a whole set of post-pandemic permanent changes um we have permanent changes in how we look at the economy right now look at the labor the tight labor markets here in the u.s and the power is still with some of those specialized workers look at the high interest rates and inflation that many are saying are now going to be a permanent feature. And then obviously the workplace, work from home, um, the focus on mental health, the need for leaders to really demonstrate inclusion, the need for businesses to take stances on social issues. Like we've seen a lot of post pandemic permanent changes, I would say economically in the broader business landscape and in the workplace and i look forward to discussing some of these with you today yeah brilliant because the last time we spoke up we spoke it was you're right it was it was about a couple of years ago and it was the height of the pandemic at that stage people were probably still working remotely uh you know in a, one of the various lockdowns that we had so i suppose just to give a bit of context around that because it, to me that seems like almost a lifetime ago that that, that, that happened it's nearly hard to believe that you know, and, and I was having a conversation on another podcast this morning that, you know, when do we mark the end of the pandemic? Is it over or are we still in it? Or, you know, there's all of these kind of questions still floating about, but you're so right that there's a lot of things that have changed that are, are they're never going to be the same again. Once you've given people a taste for, for working from home, for supporting with mental health issues or mental well-being, you know, the there's no kind of going back from that. What would you say are the, the biggest things to come out of that and, and maybe some of the challenges that companies have in, in implementing? Yeah. Um, so, so it is interesting you say that we're not going back because not everyone agrees. Not okay. every leader in corporate America or oh, the globe yeah. agrees <laughs> with kind of like some people do want to go back to five days a week. Yeah. Um, some economists actually believe we're going to go back to kind of different lower inflation rates, lower interest rates, et cetera, um, or rising unemployment. And the U.S. unemployment is 50 year record low. Um, but as I think about business, like I think a couple of things, um, the role of leadership as a capability and whether you call it management, upskilling, leadership development training um, is so, so important right now. And whether that's how do you lead in a recessionary environment? How do you lead in uncertain times? How do you bring all of the people in your organization together and give people an active voice and be seen and heard? So the whole kind of piece around being inclusive, um, that is so important right now. And many, many firms are continuing to invest in the concept of kind of leadership and management. Um, we have to talk about technology because technology literally saved us through the pandemic with the move to work from home, learn from home if you have children. Um, but now what we're seeing is significant more investments in firms looking to move to the cloud, um, firms needing to shore up their security because cybersecurity is still an issue, whether you're a business trying to protect your customer's assets or um, the government or schools, et cetera. Um, and the other piece is the investments in new skills is something that some firms are investing in if you think about decarbonization of supply chains and how do we kind of move into green jobs and what are those new skills that people need how do people better understand climate how do they understand the impact on on their supply chain how do they understand kind of the disclosures but also other skills about how we use technology um generative ai Aoife, is the latest one that everyone's looking at to say <laughs> You know, can I use, <laughs> yes, can I use something like that? Yeah. Um, is it going to automate away my job if I'm in media mm -hmm. or in research? Yeah. Um, and we've got to look at this again through the 25-year lens that I've been working in business to say, 
We've seen these technologies come and go. The need, the important thing is for business and, and workers to actually say, where can I use this technology to augment my job? Where can I get more productivity to have or, you know, augmented intelligence or an assistant like that? In the same way that when we move from spreadsheet to more visualization tools, mm -hmm. if you want to kind of do data analytics, you kind of you've got to embrace that. So um, technology has been great. Technology is also a big sense of fear. It's a sense of hype. Um, but the, I think it's really important for businesses and, and workers listening in to say, how am I staying relevant around different mm -hmm. forms of technology um, and how can it not be fearful, but how can it actually augment what I do? And, and am I building jobs for the future? Green jobs were just a, an example. Yeah, yeah, love that. Can we maybe come back to this idea of the five days in the office? I'd love to get your thoughts maybe from a personal perspective, but also what you're seeing out in, in, in the client landscape. Is there, and maybe it's there's no one size fits all and it really depends on the organization, but are you seeing kind of pushback from employees in, in organizations when, when leaders are demanding five days in the office? Yeah, we see lots of active pushback. You see um, activist groups form at tech firms, at some <laughs> of the financial firms earlier in the pandemic. Wow. Um, you see on social media kind of people are calling out their own organization. Hmm. I actually think as, as, a, as an advisor's business, that's quite sad when your employees feel that the only thing they can do is lash out at you on social media. Yeah, yeah. Um, having a transparent... If you're a bank and you want people in five days a week, or if you're working in a secure industry and you're really worried about access to proprietary data and knowledge, and you insist on people being five days a week, and I have clients who do both, as long as you are deliberate around, this is what the expectations are, this is the role, this is why, this is maybe where you might have some discretion in the future or not, just people want transparency and then they can make their own decisions. Yeah. Um, what too many businesses have done is they've said hybrid, but not really defined it. Yeah. And then you've just got this inequity between um, and this divisiveness between some people who live 2000 miles away from the office and never come in and other people who come in every day and pay for their commute. And it, it's the them and us piece. So firms that have been inconsistent about what does hybrid mean? Um, and trying to embrace too much flexibility, but deep down in executive rooms actually saying, we want people in the office four days a week. That's the tricky piece where they, they feel stuck in the middle. But um, I applaud the businesses who actually say they're five days a week, so at least they're transparent and you can be very, very clear. Yeah, yeah. I love that whole idea of being transparent and setting those really clear expectations from the outset. I've seen complaints that jobs being advertised on LinkedIn, for example, would be uh, advertised as hybrid but then when it comes to the crunch actually they want you in the office more than they they kind of want you at home um i mean i can see the benefits of both i can see the benefit of bringing people together i think nothing really beats that face-to-face -face interaction especially those kind of incidental water cooler moments for want of a better word but i can also see the benefit of working from home with the additional time maybe you have more focused time if you have a separate office or a separate space to do your work so there are definitely benefits to both and i love this idea that it's about setting those expectations from the outset and maybe not blindsiding people with oh yeah well we said it was hybrid we've hired you now and actually you're going to be in the office for four days a week and we're calling that hybrid which Technically it is, but maybe the expectations were that you'd be working in the office two days a week or one day a week or something like that. Yeah. Are you seeing that there's any, uh, you know, based on, on, on kind of what I was saying there, that there's benefits to both? Are you seeing that there's any organizations being particularly successful in implementing one or the other, like, like maybe a hybrid model or a return to work policy? I think the firms that, that do this best have just said hybrid is going to be a way for our future mm. um and they've either set like the tuesday wednesday thursday because it works for them um some businesses have, have had their managers apply discretion to say it, it's really it's really up to you um but those firms that are investing in how do you lead in that environment how do you make everyone feel that they can can communicate how do you run these hybrid hybrid meetings mm. um What's the schedules? And then also, if you think about performance reviews, how do we make sure that we're not, if you've made a commitment to hybrid, that we're not 
unfairly discriminating against those people who are not in the office as much. And as I, as I think about the two personas that I that I really are concerned about, the first one is young people. Yeah. I actually believe that young people need to be in the office more than more than not. They need to be there for socialization. They need to be there for um, onboarding. They need to be there for learning and connectivity. Young people are struggling, Aoife. Um, mm-hmm. I, I teach a class at, at Stern since we, we met. And so kind of exposed to that young people need to be around other kindred spirits. Then the other extreme is caregivers. We have a huge caregiving issue here in the US. We don't we don't fund um, maternity or paternity or any kind of dependent care piece as much as say Europe. Um, and the real issue there is caregivers need much more flexibility yeah. and they've got longer commutes. And so we cannot expect the same thing of a caregiver as a non-caregiver. And so businesses that lean into that, and especially if we think about the future to say, we are going to actually have a different a different approach to what you know for caregivers because mm-hmm. it's best for business and best for society because the US has a demographic issue. Like yeah. We're not we we've got more jobs than we've got people in the workforce right now with yeah. record low unemployment. So um a little bit a little bit off topic, but the demographics and the investments in kind of caregivers mm-hmm. um and encouraging people to actually have families because we know that that's declined around yeah. much of the developing world, including the US. Um, I see that as an important role that businesses can yeah. lean into. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And, and I suppose playing devil's advocate here, do you think that would cause a bit of a, a them and us situation in organizations if they're giving specific um, uh, leniency or flexibility to to people who are in caregiving situations? Yes, but this is where businesses could actually show some leadership. If businesses want to be purposeful and they want to be inclusive, yeah. what better way than actually say, we value the caregiver, whether you're taking care of dependent yeah. um, family members, whether you're a father or a mother taking care of your, can your kids, especially in those early years. Um, you know, Otherwise, we, we're, we're going to have less family formation. We're going to have less people kind of, you know, taking care of, um, you know, older people who have kind of worked with dignity and pride in, you know, providing for all of us. So I do think that there is a big role that progressive businesses who yeah. can afford to could take the lead on this and deal with the consequences that you described. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really, really interesting, actually, that, that perspective. And I think it's, you're so right, it's an opportunity to actually demonstrate leadership in society perspective, you know, showing how you're giving back to the community, how you're supporting that. I'm also interested in how things are are so different in the US than they are from Europe. And does that require change at a governmental level or a state level or, or any thoughts around how to drive that type of change in the workplace? Yeah, I mean, um, the the role of the states and the role of, um, you know, cities within those states is, is critical. So engaging with like the local chamber of commerce and saying, you know, what's different what what's right for minneapolis may not be right for chicago and so i think that that's going to be there there's some structural challenges um here in the us that you just don't have in europe but we talked about kind of maternity leave there's the you know the at will employment here um labor markets are much more flexible here um people can you know can leave and get other jobs in a much more kind of quicker fashion so that there, there are some there are some changes. There were changes in terms of how both economies dealt with the the unemployment at the start of COVID. Um, the US chose to give stimulus, whereas um, in Europe it was much more people getting you know the employers being encouraged to being funded to keep people on payroll. So yeah. um, there are some differences, but this whole topic of the future of work, hybrid, the role of leaders, how we embrace technology in the right way without fear seems to be a global phenomenon. Every yeah. client that I work with globally is kind of still challenged with, I want to transform my business. Mm-hmm. I know I need technology. I know that people are so critical, but people need more skills. People need better kind of psychological safety. Yeah. Um, and we also see a lot of talent hoarding. Um, people are holding on to their talent, even though you read about layoffs in the tech sector and a little bit in financial services, people are still holding on to their talent because we have labor shortages and we have low unemployment. So that that's another interesting phenomenon, um, especially kind of in the US, but I see that also in, in other developed markets like the UK and places like Australia. 
Yeah. And I'd love to, to dive into that a little bit more. So talent hoarding, essentially, you're holding on to people, even though you don't necessarily have the work to give to them. Is that essentially what it is? You may you may have the work, but maybe you're in different times, you would maybe cut the bottom 10% by okay. performance. We're yeah. seeing less of that. Yeah. We're seeing we're also seeing interestingly like less voluntary attrition now so the great resignation has dwindled a little bit that was last year's news we're yeah. now seeing kind of people staying at companies because the grass was not always greener but we're also seeing firms that can hold on to their people because it's been such a challenge to hire and onboard talent um over the last 12 to 18 months yeah yeah so i so if what i understand correctly is that from both from an organization's perspective and from an individual's perspective neither are kind of making any great moves to part ways mm -hmm. with each other from an individual they the grass wasn't necessarily greener but they don't want to jump ship just yet from an organization's perspective they want to hold on to the talent that they have because they knew how challenging it was to get them in in the first place Absolutely, by and large. And again, yeah. except those businesses, say, in the tech sector that yeah. anticipate a level of demand for their products and services that just hasn't happened. And yeah. um, in the same way that any supply demand equation kind of will will play out, um, they are eliminating headcount. But yeah. um, that tech sector workforce is finding other jobs. Yes. Um, yeah. Here in the US. And it's a it's a mobile, it's an experienced workforce. And it's a mm. workforce that by and large, doesn't have to worry about its economic security as much as, say, essential workers. Yeah, yeah, really good point as well. I think there was a lot of talk on social media about the challenges and difficulties of finding more work. But I think if you have something like, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a big name on your CV or if you have that experience in the tech sector, then I think it, it makes it a little bit easier maybe to find to find a new job i'd love to come back to this um this idea of leadership and the skills shortages and what you see as the gaps and the opportunities for leaders or leadership training yeah so we're working with a lot of businesses that are saying we now need to manage in a different way mm -hmm. um some of that is because of the age of the managers they haven't lived through a high interest rate environment they haven't lived through economic recession or uncertainty um they haven't had to demonstrate such inclusive leadership skills and say manage in a hybrid workplace so mm -hmm. so some of it's generational some of it's yeah. the situation we're in by and large the skills that that firms are saying that they need more of is the human leadership skills empathy collaboration mm -hmm. working with different ecosystems um personalizing that leadership approach to people but also there's some hard skills that leaders need today. One is around redesigning work. Every business out there is looking for efficiencies right now, looking for productivity gains, trying to do more, more with less. Because um, if you look at earnings and you look at kind of economic indicators, we are it is softening. Um, and there will be, whether it's a deep recession or a shallow recession, there will be some kind of recession that impacts every business and every bottom line. So businesses are trying to lean into productivity and drive more efficiency. And leaders have to have a skill in redesigning that work, which means process, technology skills, et cetera. And then different leaders are having to demonstrate different technical skills that are relevant for their industry. The energy industry leaders have to really understand different aspects of uh, climate and different aspects of how do I decarbonize my supply chain? Um, in the same way, the tech sector needs to understand um, what are the externalities um, of the emissions that I'm creating through my data centers mm -hmm. or the externalities around the products I'm creating if there's going to be disinformation through my social media piece. So leadership is is the human skills. It's the redesign work skills. But increasingly that there's other kind of technical skills, some of which are going to be ESG related. Um, again, ESG gets a lot of politicization a lot of divisiveness some people want it to go away but we are seeing increasingly that an area where firms are saying our leaders need to be much more relevant again based on our business model around different aspects of ESG yeah and I'm curious because I thought ESG was a big thing and it's a it's a really great benefit for organizations and especially for younger generations when when companies are trying to attract talent that they talk about their sustainability initiatives but you're saying that some people are kind of going a little bit against that i'd love to to understand a little bit more behind that 
some businesses are saying um we've completed the disclosures um that's what we want to that's what we want to do um others if you look at kind of commentators in in the business community and kind of in the media they're they're saying this is a lot this is kind of really really unwieldy we're kind of mixing environment and climate with some of the social issues around okay. good jobs and around uh, diversity etc and some questions around should we be separating that should we okay. be separating kind of the work that businesses do on climate and their emissions and their supply chain from some of the social and employment pieces um and then and some people some people are still climate deniers and and see this as not important or they see it as a much longer term issue and they don't see that businesses should be driving net zero um, okay, yeah. even though they even though their governments may have agreed to it some businesses privately or publicly are saying you know this is less important to, to us we're going to still either fund or invest in fossil fuels you're absolutely mm -hmm. right that the younger generation wants to join companies that have purpose and values aligned with their own and their stance on the environment and on climate by and large is something that generation z leans into mm -hmm. um but not everyone and um i think what we need to understand as business people is the esg topic can be very polarizing even the return to office project, um, topic can be very polarizing. What what leaders need to do is artfully go through the discussion to say, how is it relevant to our business, to our community? Let's be transparent around what we're going to do to commit to that. Um, and then people can make their choices. Yeah. Uh, whether it's a return to office strategy or or a, or a climate strategy, if they're, yeah. if they're uncomfortable with the stances that their own companies are taking. Yeah. So listening to employees watching out for the key indicators within your own business and then going back to your earlier point making a leadership decision you know stepping up as a leader and saying i'm taking ownership of this this is what we're doing and you know let the cards fall where they where they may essentially um Bishan, i've loved this conversation so far is there anything else that you feel we need to touch on in relation to the future of work that we haven't maybe covered yet uh, the, the one thing i would just just highlight is um We've got a demographic issue in the workplace in many developed um, economies. We Here in the US, we have more job openings than we have people looking for employment. We only have um, a labor force participation rate of 61%. So the more that we can, whether it's through immigration, whether it's through um, kind of, you know, encouraging more people to have children or making the cost of childcare less prohibitive so that people don't have to make choices between having a family and having a job um you know or if it's if it's other ways to kind of you know whether it's refugees whether it's immigration to say how do we actually uh, identify members of our workforce in the next 5 10 15 years for me that's a real challenge for business and society um, it's not that we don't have enough jobs. It's not that the robots are taking their jobs. It's that we don't have enough skilled workers. And skill doesn't mean PhDs. It could also be trade skills. Um, and if I worry about that, you know, as a US resident, um, I worry about that when I look at other economies that are much more demographically challenged and have aging populations. And yeah. I think that's something, again, that businesses and governments are going to have to work on. But we probably don't talk enough about some of those demographic changes are going to hit many businesses and societies yeah really really interesting and you know on, on one of my previous podcast episodes we did talk about not necessarily that as a challenge but the talent pools that are not currently being tapped into for example so if people have been out of the workplace for a long time or people have been living abroad for a time and they're returning to their home country you know there's all of these pools of talent and um, or, or even retirement age and thinking of things like that that you reach this stage where it's like a, it's a cliff so you're working full time and then suddenly you're not working and from a personal perspective maybe you feel like you no longer have a purpose but from an organizational perspective you're losing all of that skill and talent kind of quite suddenly as well so um lots of stuff to to think about there um Bhushan, the question i ask everyone who comes on the podcast what does being happier at work mean to you um fulfilled um, in doing my work and having a close connection to seeing the outcomes of my work. So if I'm working with clients on a big transformation program 
actually seeing that through and seeing them execute and actually drive the outcomes that they're looking for, whether they be customer, financial, people, regulatory, quality outcomes. Um, it's it's just it's working on meaningful stuff and seeing kind of the outcomes and the results of of that work. Yeah. Absolutely. And that ties in with, you know, the kind of whole ethos around to have your work. So really, really like that as a as an approach. Anything else that you want to add before we kind of wrap things up for today? No, I've um, congratulations on your podcast. I've listened to a number of them. I, I love being part of this journey that I think you started a number of years ago. So mm -hmm. congratulations to you. Um, and, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, being podcast 150. <laughs> brilliant um and if people want to reach out if they want to connect with you what's the best place that they can do that yeah if they want to connect with me on linkedin or twitter we can kind of include that in in the show flow and they can kind of see some of the articles and publications and and speeches i've given happy to brilliant. connect that's great thank you so much for your time today really really enjoyed that conversation my pleasure thank you